Welcome to Wireless Land Weekly, a podcast focused on the wireless networking professional. We aim to educate, inform, entertain, and inspire. Get ready to listen and enjoy. Now to our host of the show, Keith Parsons. This is Keith Parsons with another episode of Wireless Land Weekly. This is episode 19. Glad you've stayed with us all these uh, many weeks. It's been kind of a, a fun trip, and we're glad you're here. Uh, this week's topic is being counterintuitive. Uh, many of the things that have to do with wireless lands are counterintuitive. In my travels around uh, in consulting and in training, I've met a lot of people who think wireless lands work one way, and then when we show them how they actually work, they're kind of amazed. Uh, there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding. A lot of things are wrong with wireless lands. Um, the way some of the vendors show them, and especially some of the marking pieces. So today's episode, we're going to go through and talk about some of those. Uh, glad you could join us for the show. Rant, pet peeve, what really bugs you? 60 seconds of complaining starts now. Hi, my name is Dave Coleman with Air Spy Training. Uh, one of my biggest WLAN pet peeves is vendor terminology. I realize that uh, wireless LAN vendors have to come up with their own terms and marketing phrases for their equipment and solutions, especially if they're proprietary. But very often their terminology causes problems and confusions in the marketplace. Perfect example is how the vendors have very often you'll see um, refer to something WPA PA is WPA AES. They might even be supplying a AES solution, but the Wi-Fi Alliance didn't approve AES encryption and CCMP encryption using AES uh, cryptography until WPA2 came out. I can give numerous examples of this. Uh, both from a security perspective and just a simple WLAN deployment pr perspective. I just wish vendors would use more of the common terminology that's used by the IEEE and the Wi-Fi Alliance. Things every wireless LAN professional needs to know. Gear up, buckle down, and stand by for the real techie stuff. This week's episode is, again, just uh, me, Keith Parsons. I'm here in a hotel room outside of Chicago this week. I've been thinking about some of the things that uh, show up in class when I'm on a consulting gig and people mention something, and I, I kind of give them a double take and look and say, what? What? How did, how did you think of that? And they assume certain things about wireless LANs because they're like something else, right? And so I... A couple of weeks ago, went out and uh, asked some friends on Twitter and on e via email and met some people in person and talked about this idea of counterintuitiveness. And then something that's counterintuitive is uh, the, it's an adjective, obviously, counterintuitive. And it, what it means is contrary to what common sense would suggest. And there's a lot of things that fit in that category. We'd like our life to be fairly simple. Take arithmetic. Nice, easy, simple, like 2 plus 2 equals 4. Easy to understand and simple calculation. And in our world of computer networks, there are some other simple ideas too. For example, we have a link light on the back of an Ethernet NIC, and when the light is off, we know that there is a problem. The problem happens to be at the physical layer and perhaps at the Mac layer, but we know where to look because we have a simple link light that will tell us that. Now, if the link light is on and the network is still not working, we know where to not look. We don't need to look down the stack. We can look up the stack, and that'll help us do a little troubleshooting. It's a very simple, easy-to-understand concept, and we like those in our life. Our minds like thinking about simple, easy-to-understand things, but everything in life doesn't fit in that category. On the surface, we can think one thing, and then we come across some empirical evidence. Empirical evidence is something we learn through our own eyes. We see, we touch, we feel, we test. Uh, I like empirical evidence. It's, uh, I think, one of the best ways we can learn. And sometimes that empirical evidence goes counter to our first initial intuitive reaction, thus counterintuitive. On the show notes, there's a graphic there. It's a graphic of red, green, and blue circles. And this is additive colors. And in additive colors, when you mix red and green, you get yellow. Well, that's different than we're nor normally like to see. We have different kind of view of the world because we normally use things like paint. And when you mix a yellow and blue, you'll get green. But when we do things with light, it acts differently. So there's a graphic there. Look at the graphic. And the first reaction wouldn't be that if you mixed red, green, and blue light, you'd get white. 
and yet that's how the light systems work. It's not intuitive, and then once you experience it, you'll go, oh, okay, yeah, that's even true. In other times, we have other situations, and our perceptions of how the world around us kind of distort reality. What we see looks one way, and then we look a little harder, we can see something else. An example of this is also in the show notes. There's a graphic. On the left side is a square box made of lines. And when you look at it, you can look and say, well, the box comes forward toward us, and the back plane is the back, or the side, or the top, or the bottom when we're looking from the top down. It's an optical illusion, and you don't know exactly what's going on. On the right side, there's another one there. I just put it there to mess with your mind. It's optical illusion that can't actually be made. But it's just to let you see that sometimes what we perceive isn't actually true. We have to do some evidence gathering to find out. Well, in this podcast, we're going to talk about some of the things that are counterintuitive with respect to wireless LANs. Oh, there there are many of these that we need as wireless LAN professionals to be prepared for. Those first initial intuitive reactions will oftentimes lead you to failure. So pay attention, listen through these, and let's talk some of, through some of the counterintuitive issues that I've come across. And if you come across any of them on your own, oh, please feel free to leave comments and feedback and send email. I would love to hear from you. Now, a lot of these came from uh, Twitter and email and some other conversations I had with individuals. It is by no means an exhaustive study. It's just a place to uh, get you started thinking. In the show notes, there's also a picture of a prescription lid. And so it's just not us in wireless lands that have issues. This one says, close, tightly, open, push, down, turn, all these other things that when you look at it, you go, what am I supposed to do? And yet, once you know how to open a prescription, push down first, and then twist to turn, and though it says close tightly on top, what it really means is, well, when you're closing, close tightly, but when you're opening, do this something else. And the same lid has to say this two different pieces of information. So let's get on to our list of counterintuitive issues with wireless LANs. We don't have time in this podcast to go into the details behind each of these, but I do recommend if there's any of these that you run across, and you can uh, go to the show notes and read them slowly, individually, or uh, as you're listening, you think, what? I do that one. Well, you ought to go and do some more studying and find out why. I'm a strong believer in that empirical evidence thing. Go and set up a lab, set up the situation, and test it on your own and see what goes on. Study. Check the protocol itself out. We live in a world with uh, wireless lands with RF where we can't see RF. And because we can't see it with our eyes, sometimes we have to use other tools to help us give that information. Now, we're not quite to the range of particle physicists who also can't see what they're working on and have to find ways to get around it, but we're kind of headed that direction. So I recommend using the lab and seeing with your own eyes and experiencing each of these issues, and then you'll, you'll kind of own it yourself. So the first one here, and the one I I usually run across first is people are like, well, if we add more overhead, we'll decrease throughput. That's not always the case in wireless LANs. In fact, part of the protocol allows for something called hidden node reduction, and we use RTS, CTS. And when you add RTS and CTS, that's a request to send and a clear to send packet, when you add those to your network, you're thinking that instead of us going data act, data act, data act, we're now going to go RTS, CTS, data act, RTS, CTS, data act. It definitely adds overhead. And yet, sometimes, if the situation is right, by adding overhead, we increase throughput. There's a lot of pieces in there. Uh, if we go into the Wayback Machine back into 1984, Pretty good year, not a bad book, and the Apple Macintosh came out that year. In 1984, for $265, you could purchase an Ethernet card. That Ethernet card ran over twisted pair cable and got 10 meg throughput. At the same time, you could go to Macintosh, and for free, you got Local Talk. Local Talk ran over twisted pair as well. Same cable, but the difference was Local Talk only got 180K. 180K, that's that's abysmally small today. Now, back then, when you just were going to print to a laser writer printer, it was fine. The difference is, Ethernet ran CSMA CD. 
local talk ran CSMA CA. And today in wireless, we're also running CSMA CA. So compared to the local talk version, which got 180K, if we net 5.5 meg for 811B, we're doing fantastic. How did we get that much faster with CSMA CA than the local talk? Well, we got there by adding overhead. I know, counterintuitive makes you stop and think a minute, how can adding overhead make your network go faster? Well, if your network's going terribly rotten, no traffic or very low traffic, by organizing the packets, structure will allow better throughput. That's kind of how RTS-CTS does its bit. By organizing and having that extra little bit of overhead, we allow traffic to go and not bump into each other. Any of you who've ever been to third world countries and seen roads where you line up in front of a, I don't know, a a train barricade when the train's coming and everyone lines the full width of both lanes. And then when the train finishes going through, you have this massive chaos as all the cars try to get back in their own lanes. They think that they're going to go faster by not being organized. And yet everyone would actually clear the traffic much faster if they stayed in their lanes and followed the rules. A lot of the things that happen in wireless lands fit in that category. Another big one I can run across all the time is people are into RSSI. They think the more RSSI, RSSI is Receive Signal Strength Indicator, the more RSSI, the better. We want more. Well, a lot of this comes from people who started out perhaps in the RF industry in paging or walkie-talkies or radio where they're just doing uh, audio radio. And in that case, more signal was better. In Wi-Fi, though, what we want to get isn't RSSI. We want to get data throughput. Sometimes having more RSSI will decrease your data throughput. Too much signal is just as bad as too little. Well, actually, it's a different bad, but we have a different kind of bad there. And, the, and a lot of these that we're going to mention here, I'm just going to, I won't go into detail about each one, but there's something wrong with each of the following statements. I can see 16 APs from here, so I've got great signal. Well, how many APs did you need to see? You might need one so you can stay connected. You might need a second for a backup or for redundancy. But after that, it's just going to start causing more co-channel interference. And because in wireless we are a collision domain, each of our frequencies is a shared media So everyone who can see each other on channel one has to wait and play nice and work together. The more people we have who can see each other on channel one, the larger our collision domain, the slower our net throughput. So seeing lots of APs isn't necessarily a good thing. In fact, many times it's a bad thing. Another big one. VLANs on wireless LANs separate collision domains. No, they don't. VLANs on switches separate broadcast domains, but when you put that same VLAN signal to an access point and assign the VLAN to an SSID, the SSID is being broadcast on, let's say, channel one. If I have an AP with three SSIDs, voice, data, and guest, and they're all on channel one, they're all sharing the same collision domain. Even though the packet that went to the voice SSID would go off to the voice VLAN in the air, in the RF environment, they're all sharing the same collision domain. They're also sharing the same collision domain with everyone else who's within range on the same frequency. So sometimes we come from a switched world where we use VLANs to separate things out. When we go and apply that to RF, it doesn't do anything. In fact, it adds more overhead and lowers our throughput. Another big one. Noise, the noise function in a wireless NIC, will show us what's going on with ambient RF. I have an exercise, a little uh, lab process that I go through to demonstrate that a spectrum analyzer can actually see microwave ovens, Bluetooth, portable phones, video cameras, see raw ambient RF. And we go through great detail seeing the, the signatures that they show how each of them looks from a mouse to a portable phone to a video camera, and we can come back and recognize those anytime they show up in our spectrum analyzer. Uh, Also showing jammers, both broadband jammers and narrowband jammers. And then I do the exact same set of equipment, the jammers, the Bluetooth, the mouse, and we look at them through the eyes of a wireless NIC. 
amazing. The Nick cannot pick up any of those. Sometimes the Nick will show, oh, I have a lot of noise, when actually it was a very lightweight noise. Other times, like when the jammer is on, it's totally knocking off all possible packets that are going on, and the wireless Nick says, oh, there's no noise here. Well, it says there's no noise because there's no packets. Wireless NICs get their noise variable from packets. If there are no packets, there is no noise. So sometimes, actually m most of the time, the noise function in your wireless NIC is not going to be able to let you see ambient RF issues. You need to have a spectrum analyzer that shows that. A couple years ago when Cisco bought Cognio, and now as they've just rolled out their clean air technology, they're also supporting this idea that they know their NICs by themselves can't see ambient RF. Some vendors think that their, uh, quote, spectrum analyzer, because they analyze spectrum, they look at the channels, it still comes off a wireless NIC. The NIC does not have the ability to see RF issues. Another one that's counterintuitive. We need different SSIDs for each purpose in our network. So our APs support up to 16 AP SSIDs. Let's use them all. Well, every SSID you add adds more overhead. Each one go, is broadcast 10 times per second per AP per SSID. And I've been on sites where 25, 30% of the potential carrying capacity of the network has been lost just with the little chattering that goes on with all the APs broadcasting their SSIDs. Some other ones. If you point your antenna to where the signal source, it'll work better. Well, the dead zone, the weakest spot of an omnidirectional antenna is coming out of the tip. And I have seen people who point those thinking they're pointing something. They're pointing actually the dead zone on there. Another big one, and I get this from uh, people I call a CMRs, Certified Magazine Readers. They're the guys who come in and say, oh, don't worry, we designed our wireless LAN, and it works with voice, video, data, barcode scanners, and location tracking all at the same time. And my answer is, no, you didn't, because many of those systems have mutually exclusive design goals. That you can't cover them both at the same time. A lot of people think that if we just have coverage, and you know, I want to put them in the Wayback Machine and say, yeah, maybe in 1998 or 2001, coverage was all we cared about. Today, coverage isn't enough. We need more than just coverage. So just because you have a lot of coverage doesn't mean you're ready for voice or location tracking. That's a different design. One from Marcus Burton was on N increases collisions. And so some people think the N gets fast because it decreases collisions. It actually increases collisions. And yet we still get higher throughput even though we have more retries and collisions. That, that's, again, kind of counterintuitive. Another one. We just went out and bought brand new 811N equipment. We're going to get 300 meg throughput. I uh, No, no, you're not. You need to look into the protocol and see what actually is going to happen and make some adjustments. I think for anyone who's thinking to go to N, and I believe everyone who's listening to this podcast needs to be thinking today about going to N, is to run some experiments and find out what are you really going to get so you can set your expectations properly. The next two are kind of backwards to each other. Multipath is good and multipath is bad. Well, it all depends. Multipath is good if you're N and is bad if you're non-N. How do you work around that? That's where you have to stop and think and study and practice and learn these things. Another one that's really counterintuitive is uh, people who say, oh, we use Windows Zero Config. It gives us everything we need. I, yeah, that, uh, let us know how that works out for you. Windows Zero Config is easy. It's free. And it's ubiquitous. It's just about everywhere. And everyone who's running Windows products have it. And yet it doesn't give you the detail and the granularity you might need to manage your own wireless network. Another one, all we need is the latest drivers, so we put in the latest drivers on the client and it will fix the problem. Another thing that's misunderstood is wireless networks, the network itself, the APs, are responsible for telling the clients when to roam. We have some magic ARM or RRM or some magic little algorithm inside our network that's going to make all of our clients happy. PoE. It's just PoE. All PoE is the same. They wouldn't have let us configure the AP to channel 2 if it wasn't all right. Channel 2 is never right. Ever. When you're on channel 2, you're harming everyone on channel 1, and you're harming a little bit on channel 6, and every time you transmit, someone's going to transmit on top of you, and you're going to have a massive amount of collisions. There is no legitimate reason to ever be on channel 2. 
Another thing that's misunderstood is APs are just wireless switches. We've been in the switch world for, oh, I don't know, at least a decade where everything is all switched. Very little non-switch traffic out there. Probably 15 years it's been all switched. And many of you have never worked on hubs, and yet every single AP is a hub, and we have to treat them as hubs and design around them as hubs. Here's another one. We have great RSSI. We got NEG65 everywhere. Thus, voice will run fine on our wireless LAN. No, it's not going to work that way. You need to go back and study and find out what your voice over IP clients need. They might need NEG65, but they need a lot more things than just a single AP at NEG65. Another one, people look at those little bars. You know those little bars? In fact, I'm a little frustrated. I get frustrated with uh, Singular and AT&T with their more bars and more places. That has caused more trouble on wireless networks than anything I can think of. Humans clients, not the NIC clients, human clients look down and see the little bars and go, oh, I have not very many bars. My network's bad. Or they see a lot of bars and they think it's good. Just because you have bars doesn't mean it's going to be good. And just because the bars aren't there doesn't mean it's going to be bad. It is a calculation. It is a reflection of somebody's algorithm. It's not exactly what's going on there. Well, I've been rambling on here now for, oh, 20 minutes or so, talking about each of these things. The rest of them I'm not going to get into quite such detail on. But I do believe you need to think about them and see why they were added here. And all of these that I'm giving you had come from a variety, probably 20 different sources of people who've mentioned these things as something they've seen as counterintuitive. So a couple of these coming out. It's better to have our APs on all channels than only on 1.6.11, because on 1.6.11, they'll have to share. The SSID is unsecure. That means it's easy for me to use. I should use it, right? AP's power settings go from 1 to 10. That's low to high. 90 dB is better than 40 dB because 90 is a bigger number. MB or MB, what's the difference? Capital M, little lowercase b, capital M, uppercase b. Oh, they just mean the same thing. APs are routers. They route on the network. I turned on QoS, so our voice is now going to work on our wireless LAN. We decided to put all of our APs on one channel to cut down on problems. Our APs are on 1611 only. Well, it all depends. Are you running SCA or MCA? And if you don't know those two terms, go look them up. There's an entire set of technology in wireless LANs dealing with single-channel architecture and multiple-channel architecture. And it's something you need to learn and look at. We like to use channels 1, 4, 8, and 11. That gives us more throughput. Or we're in Europe, so we use 1, 7, and 13. We get to stay away from all those people on 1, 6, and 11. We need to increase the range of our network, so we added wireless range extenders, and now we'll share our throughput with more people. We must buy all our equipment from the same vendor. Now, that one actually could be true. It depends on your political uh, layer 8 issues inside your company. We can force our neighbors to go to different channels and turn down their power. More power equals more throughput. We had a problem in one location. Don't worry, we fixed it. We added more APs. And the final one today is getting RF coverage is hard to do. Actually, getting RF coverage is easy. Coverage is the easiest thing when it comes to designing wireless networks. Coverage is easy. When I teach an advanced wireless design class, I think I say the words coverage is easy at least 40 times in three days. Getting coverage is a breeze. Getting coverage that works properly, now that's what's difficult. So let's not think about all of these issues we just covered here. Go to the show notes, look at them, and see why they were included in this counterintuitive argument bit. If you've said any of these, or believe any of them still, I recommend going back to your studies. Set up your little lab configuration, try it. I am such a strong believer in empirical evidence. Go, try it. Prove to yourself that these statements are either true or false. Now, they've been added here because a lot of people have thought they were false, but you need to prove it yourself. Prove it until you can have the validity yourself that you know that these statements are true or not, and then you'll be able to be a better admin, a better designer, and better able to troubleshoot your own wireless network.
This was supposed to be a little reality check today. Just a check to see if you've been listening, if you've been tracking inside your wireless network, and if you've said any of these things, come back and take a look at it. Wireless lands sometimes are counterintuitive. Thanks for listening. Elevator speech. Our guests have just two minutes to tell us all about their product or service offering. Ready, set, go. Training is essential to being able to perform properly in the environment. And without good training, you miss a lot of the theoretical side. You miss a lot of the stuff that has learned by others that is being transferred. So VLogic and Wireless Training Solutions prides itself in being able to take experiences and, and turn that into knowledge transfer for the students. We do that in several different ways. The first way is that we provide on-location training. The second way is that we provide online training. And the third way is that we provide on-demand training. So with the on-location training, uh, instructors provide live services to a, a legacy classical style classroom environment. With the online classes, instructors still lead the classes, but through a distance education connection, uh, which uses a go-to meeting style of a connection and a shared whiteboard and shared presentation materials. In our online classes, we also offer remote access into a live wireless training solutions network operations center so that using a VNC connection, students can actually take control of a, a large amount of industry recognized equipment, wireless LAN equipment such as wireless LAN controllers, wireless LAN access points, wireless intrusion prevention systems, and uh, many other types of resources that are difficult and expensive to attain on one's own. On the on-demand classes, students can actually take part in the same type of classes that are, are listed and available for instructor-led, but they can take them on an as-needed basis. In some cases, they can take them uh, uh, chapters at a time. You can contact us at wirelesstrainingsolutions.com which is the online store and training center student support area for VLogic Incorporated. Well, thanks for listening to another episode of Wireless LAN Weekly. This was episode 19 on wireless LANs being counterintuitive. I hope you learned something, and if... Through the process and listening through this big, long list, you were able to uh, perhaps understand something a little better. That is fantastic. If after listening to these, you can think of other uh, silly statements or uh, things that are being misunderstood currently with wireless LAN, you might have some more of your own. Or if you want to uh, discuss any further about any of the ones we talked about, go to the comment section and leave your comments there. Thanks, and we'll talk to you again next week. Wireless LAN Weekly, a podcast focused on the needs of wireless LAN professionals. We look forward to your feedback. Please leave your comments at the bottom of the show notes or email feedback on the show can be sent to feedback at wirelesslandprofessionals.com. If you'd like to leave a voicemail feedback, just call 24-7 and leave a message at 1-801-481-9018. Until next time, this has been another production of wirelesslandprofessionals.com, a place to educate, inform, entertain, and inspire. <laughs>